probably the most thing that changed me was what eternal life and forgiveness meant in the Bible. I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. So this is the flow of Jesus' logic. Having this relationship now with him, studying the Bible and coming to know who he is and what he did for me that I couldn't do for myself was a total revelation. It was three little words and they became the turning point in my life. And those words, God loves you. And he was challenged by a Christian to read the Bible with the eyes of a child. And I challenge that to everyone who doubts the accuracy of the Bible. The Bible is the sovereign word of God. I know it is. I have a testimony of the Bible. And that period of time was the realization that I didn't leave the Lord. He never left me. But as I learned that the Mormon church version of the Lord was different, I left them. The Bible is the sovereign word of God. I know it is. I have a testimony of the Bible. Thank you. We look like Mormons. We're going to talk like Mormons for a little bit here, too. You know, she paused because she almost said, and I bear this testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I was so proud of her not doing that, but it was about right here. <laughs> uh, so I, on purpose, at times will talk like a Mormon, talk like a bishop, and, and we're going to leave with you uh, copies of all of our slides. So uh, after Kathy collects herself, we're gonna, we're gonna pass out uh, copies of each one of our slides and it will have the links to where you can get electronic copies of these. So any notes that you take here, you'll be able to reproduce hundreds of copies, have little classes on your own, share with your friends, so on and so forth. So the first thing we wanna tell you is we're now moving into the, the training phase and we're gonna leave you uh, not only with the information, uh, but, but also, uh, the copy of the slide. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, is um, uh, Joe mentioned the book. Uh, the book uh, is uh, 350 pages, 312 footnotes, and those are all from Mormon scriptures. Mormon footnotes documented every claim, everything I said, because it was really uh, written for our family. Uh, and we make a dollar off of the book. That's our cost plus one dollar, and that dollar goes for gas to travel around to uh, conferences like this. And this is an awesome conference. We've learned so much. Uh, and what we've been doing and what we want to capitalize on is what you're learning are tools and techniques and different ways uh, to witness to Mormons. And this is yet just another one. It's just, it's just an, an example. And it's, it's awesome to be able to, to, to travel around and meet good people and, um, and develop friendships and realize something that we didn't know when we left Mormonism, what a great safety net the Christians have built for the Mormons. It's awesome. We came out and did this on our, on our own. We were very scared, went through a lot of problems. Uh, we weren't sure our marriage was going to last, so we've got a whole lot of information to go through, so I'm going to talk fast, but when I talk slow or when I repeat things, that means it's very, very important. And here's the first one. All of those who prepare to teach you and to witness with you fully and completely understand the responsibility they have. Because it's a dangerous subject, it's a serious subject, it is not only the word of God, but it is the lives, the testimonies, the pain, the marriages, the family relations that we're dealing with. Several times we have worked with couples in the past and some have come out of Mormonism, some haven't. Some have come back and said, thank you so much. And others have come back and said, do you know what you did to our family? You completely destroyed our family. And uh, we're, we're sorry for that, but it doesn't change the truth, does it? So we appreciate your dignity, your integrity, your spirit to take on that mission with a serious attitude, to know that we're not just showing the Mormons the difference between the Gospels or where they're wrong or where they've made mistakes. Uh, when you do that, realize with conviction that you are walking into someone else's life and possibly destroying what they consider to be a good life, but you're really giving them a great gift when we bring them to Christ. So it's a challenge, but it's also biblically correct. 
Christ himself said that he had come to separate families for his sake, if, if possible. We've made, made great friends. We thank uh, Alan and Ruth Ann for opening up their home. They're local here. We just kind of met them down in, in uh, Ephraim. And uh, this is exactly what happens. We go to Idaho. We're, next week we're going to uh, Arizona. And we meet and stay with people, and it keeps the cost down, and we get to help spread the gospel. And from a Mormon perspective, we have something that a lot of people don't have, is that detail, that history, that language, that culture behind us. So if you've got a question or a way to do it uh, uh, that's different, that's great. Because again, this is just one of very many different ways to do that. That's why I dress this way. Because it's been my experience at conferences or street preaching that uh, if I look like a bishop, talk like a bishop, and I have my bishop certificate and my uh, line of authority in the back, and I carry that with me if somebody questions it. I hand my line of authority into a Mormon. As you know, that's, that's important. And the man who ordained me was ordained by Thomas S. Monson. So there's one man between me uh, and the current prophet. Not a big deal to me, but it is to uh, a lot of uh, other people. So we take that serious and we do that. So I do this and I'm going to switch into the Mormon mode here real quick. I look like this and I talk like this because it's been my experience. Five extra people will listen for another five minutes. And sometimes that's all it takes. If that's all it does, then that's fine. Then I'll get dressed up and act foolish. But if five people say, were you really a bishop and what went wrong? And sometimes, uh, sometimes they won't ask me that if I have a t-shirt on that has uh, ACDC on it. So uh, <laughs> we're, 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 we're kind of doing this. So uh, I just want to tell you how much we appreciate being invited here and uh, being a part of this great organization. Okay, first slide. Should I run it from here? Magic. Look at that. I've got notes to keep me on track. So again, what I'm going to do is uh, talk fast on, on the general things because we got way too much to present. But we, uh, you can tell by all the speakers that we're just overflowing with, man, if we could just impart a little bit. And, and also what happens is we get support and, and sustainment from you as well. Every time we go somewhere, sometimes there's 200 people, sometimes there's two. Uh, we've been invited to people's houses to go through a missionary lesson uh, with their daughter because she's dating uh, a Mormon, and that really helps. And, and sometimes I'll tell them who I am if the missionaries are interested, and, and if not, I'll just, I won't lie to anybody, but I'll say I've read the Book of Mormon many times. I've studied Mormonism, and I have several questions. And the reason I'm doing this particular subject is because this is the one that broke my back. This is just like Earl tells his story, and it's great. We all have a very personal exit story. Now, when I was considering what was true or not true uh, in the church, uh, there were several different things, but on a personal level, the integrity and character of Joseph Smith and the church in general uh, is what just blew me away. So I can honestly say after 32 years in the church uh, that I have never been lied to. Now imagine that. Uh, a lot of Christians think, well, you're living under a lie. You're living a lie. That may be true for some people, but Lee Baker will tell you that everything I've ever learned about the church that I'll show you today is in the manuals. It's printed. It's there. I have met stake presidents on my exit because it's kind of embarrassing to excommunicate a bishop for asking questions. And, and they said, well, where did you find this out? It's in the manuals. It's there. And it's a little bit more powerful when you go to a Mormon and you show them from their own manual. It's great to have tracks and flyers and information, but when you hand a Mormon a piece of paper that's yellow and it's got blue writing all over it and they know it's not theirs, they probably won't read it. That's why on the left-hand side of the table back there, everything there is for donation only. Whatever you think it's worth, you just put it in the donation box, but it's yours for free if you can't afford anything. Because what we do when we have great opportunities like you have here, see I'm talking fast so it isn't that much important, because you could do this. The DI stores here are a wealth of information. You go to the little DI stores that are not, you know, Desert Industry, that are not in Kansas City, they're not in Denver, they're not in Duluth, they're not in Chicago. But you go here, you get the collection of the books that you're going to see here, and you can replicate this entire talk from their books. And it's a little bit more powerful when you hand them this and say, I was reading this. Or use me as the example. I heard this nut tell this story from that book. Is it true? And 
we'll, we'll go from there. And again, it, it's just a piece of the puzzle. That's why this little graphic is here. And uh, praise God for all of you and, and for my wife as well. These slides are her work. She used to be an executive secretary uh, for a high powered guy and I got the benefit of that. I come up with an idea and she puts it out on, on, on a graphic. Here we go, magic. What's next? Whoops. No, that is correct. Um, I'm a, what people call a baby Christian, so is my wife. Six years isn't very much. We're coming to know the Lord. Uh, and as Mormons have already kind of, ex-Mormons have already explained to you, we knew the Lord to a degree. And when good Christian friends come to me and say, Lee, when did you come to the Lord? Well, I can tell you when I was excommunicated in the day that I went to Kmart to go buy new underwear. But, but I, I, I came to the Lord during uh, a, a period of time. And that period of time was the realization that I didn't leave the Lord. He never left me. But as I learned that the Mormon church version of the Lord was different, I left them. So we came to a full understanding of Christ, you know, in that time, but, but it wasn't like we, we started from, from scratch. And I now understand the importance of a life verse, and this life verse uh, is just so powerful for me, and I hope everybody has a life ver verse. But paraphrasing, this is it. Uh, when Paul says, I do what I do to cut the ground from underneath those who, will be who want to be compared with us, you know, who are teaching a, a false gospel. That is exactly how I feel. When I read that scripture, I knew it was about what we do because I love the Lord so much and love his gospel. It's amazing the, the, the burning feeling we have to compare to the Mormons because they want to be like us. They, it's exactly what Paul was describing. And they all, they are false apostles and deceitful men. And, and that's exactly uh, the, the point of a life verse. This slide I put together because, and here comes the slow part, because what I'm going to teach you about is not the most important thing. Now that seems a little strange that, that an instructor of any caliber would say, what I'm going to teach you isn't the most important, but it is the clearest. It is the simplest definition of deceitfulness that got to my heart. The most important, as you see on this chart, there's a there's a big number one over there and a little number eight. On the scale of what's most important, what I'm going to tell you about now is the most important. And Kathy alluded to that. And that is the fact that the Mormons remove the word of God from the study of the Lord. And as I state here, if one removes, restricts, or rewrites the word of God, then one can teach, preach, and practice anything in the name of God. That is the most vicious, vile, and worst thing that I believe the Mormon church has done, is removed the word of God from among their people. It's not the easiest to teach, it's not the easiest to understand, but it is by far the most vile. I'm gonna teach something a little bit different and what the graphic shows is on the bottom, all those books that I got listed there, we're gonna talk about those books and again, I got uh, sets in the back and partials and some of them in the way back. I've got a complete hard copy set of everything I have and teaching from here and because some of those things have to be bought in a set, when you buy the history of the church, you normally have to buy it in a, in a set. For $40, you can have the entire set of uh, the 10 or 15 books there that teach this entire lesson, and you could mark them up and show them exactly from this. But here's the point relative to the graphic. There's no one between that young lady and her manuals. There's a whole lot of people, the first presidency, on how she views the Bible. She's told how to view the, Bible, view the Bible. She's told how to interpret it. But between the manuals that they've already printed and are approved by the First Presidency, there's no one. In other words, you show her the Relief Society manual, the Sunday School manual, the scriptures, and you can have a conversation with that person and they are representing the church on their own. If you talk about the Bible, then there's all kinds of areas for discussion and validation, and I really don't know, and I don't understand, and we'll know that when we go through the veil and all those other kind of cool things. But when you hand somebody the scriptures, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, the Book of Mormon, 
or even the Bible, their version of the Bible, and we're going to end on that, uh, how Joseph Smith changed that. There's no one that is needed between that person and the manual they are looking at. Does that make sense? Because they ha probably have that in their house. And that's what really kind of uh, crushed me. So uh, there are no restrictions between you and the person when you're teaching on that. The eighth article of faith, again, it sounds simple, but it's very complex because of the hidden details. And this is uh, an amazingly deceptive uh, teaching of, of, of the Mormons. We believe the Bible to be the word of God as far as it is translated correctly. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the word of God, the eighth article of faith. So the Mormons believe that the Bible has been corrupted and the Book of Mormon trumps the Bible. But like Kathy mentioned, and I brought this up to two different state presidents, why is there in a church that has a manual on anything from boiling water to fiscal management, literally a class on anything in between there, why is there no class, no lesson, no manual, no teachings on what is wrong with the Bible? Where is the Bible wrong? What a huge statement to make. No Christian on the planet would think about saying the Bible's corrupt and then walking away, just leaving it like that. How do you, you don't, you're not going to prove it to me? You're not going to give me an example? You're just going to let me go? That's what I meant about the difference between if you have a conversation with a Mormon and you've got a document in front of them that is produced by the church, it's not uh, gray, it's not cloudy, it's not esoteric, it's very specific, and that's what we're going to, that's what we're going to teach on. Ooh, yeah. Yes, I love this. Modern technology. Okay, it's okay that I skipped that. So, what this shows is what you have probably already. If not, you can get it in the back for free. And everything that we have here, you're getting a hard copy right there and it's available online. It is awesome that the church finally published online the Joseph Smith papers because within that, hidden within that, and trust me, there were all kinds of older Mormon leaders who were very probably hesitant to let some of that stuff go, right, Sandra? Because they knew deep in the bowels, there's all kinds of stuff that was a little bit uh, embarrassing and that's what we're gonna talk about, but it's real and, and it's actually there. So this is the, this is the uh, front of the uh, Doctrine and Covenants section uh, 132. This is in the current version and what I've got highlighted is, is what's most important. And now I'll talk a little bit slow because what I'm gonna tell you was amazing to me, but it's absolutely true. Within the heading of the Doctrine and Covenants, section 132, we learn that although this revelation was recorded in 1843, it is evident that the through the historical records that the doctrines and practices involved in this revelation had been known by the prophets since 1831. Then I'm gonna show you in another manual how it wasn't printed until 1876. So let's slow down and think about that. You see a, a missionary on the street and you want to have a real short conversation with him. And again, it's awesome to witness to a Mormon with nothing in your hands, nothing in your sleeve. You use everything that they have. And it really rocks their world when they have to go into their little satchel and pull out something that they've lived with and studied every weekend, every day. They know it really well. It's different if you pull out something and say, hey, look at this. I, I know that Joseph said this, Brigham said this. But if they are holding the Doctrine and Covenants and you're reading the heading of that, and you slowly ask them, so is it true that the doctrine was known of by 1831, wasn't recorded until 1843, and then you can say and you're going to prove to them, but it wasn't printed until 1876. So this is the doctrine of polygamy, brothers and sisters, but it wasn't even applied until years after that. So my question truly was to President Jones, I was the uh, Bishop of the Milani Second uh, Ward, Milani State, Hawaii. When we moved back to the States, I had a conversation with uh, uh, Michael uh, D. Jones, the current uh, stake president of the Arvada, Colorado Stake. And I asked him, how was it that that particular uh, section was uh, used or printed, but not used? You, you know what I'm saying? He, he, I, if it wasn't printed until 1876, whoops. If it wasn't printed until 1876, what did I do? Oh, okay, sorry. What am I doing? Okay. Okay, this is it. Uh, uh, I'm, 
electronically challenged if you, if you can't. That's why they don't let me launch missiles anymore in the military, but that's, <laughs> that's probably a good thing. But, but relatively powerful, the fact that you can see the difference. If it wasn't printed until 1876, then what was the statement that the church used? If the church says that we practiced polygamy in section 132, but it wasn't available to anybody, then the Mormon or the regular missionary or the regular member will understand that the doctrine and covenants that they carry with them is not what the early saints had. And that's what's, that's what's really the key. And in uh, section uh, 132 verses uh, uh, 58 to 66 are what's called the laws of the priesthood the laws of the priesthood. It's not a suggestion, but it's the law. And there are three in there that uh, Joseph Smith didn't cover. So should I do it? Yes. Yeah. Oh, oh, no. We work well together. We do mar bar mitzvahs, weddings, uh, <laughs> birthdays uh, uh, as well. We're, we're quite a team. Okay. So here are, the, here are the laws of the priesthood that are referenced in the doctrine and covenants that you have there in front of you. And they clearly state three laws of the priesthood. Number one, the first wife has to give her permission before a member of the Mormon church, a male member can take another wife. Number two, she has to be a virgin. Number three, she, ha she cannot be vowed to any other man. That rarely, if ever, happened. Absolutely amazing. And as we'll talk about later, and, and as Doris knows uh, all too painfully, uh, the women don't vote on this. They, 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 they make it sound like the wife has first right of refusal, but that is not true at all. Uh, even if you're asked, if you say no, it doesn't matter. Uh, Heber C. Kimball once said, uh, when he was an apostle, that he uh, thinks no more of taking another, of buying another cow than he does of taking another wife. So within a church that we participated in for so long, and it seemed to be family-centered, it's amazing now to be out of that and to see the pain, the destruction, the complexity, and the, the destruction of uh, the role of a woman in life, period, much less uh, in a church, much less in, in the, uh, w w within the scriptures. So that's what that is. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I do one more. This is awesome. This is also in a manual that I have, you, ha you can have, and it's also online. This is uh, uh, the, the Doctrine and Covenant student manual. And again, uh, this is printed by the church. It's authorized by the church. And I love how the, the church is almost, uh, what's it called when somebody has two personalities? My sister is kind of like that. Uh, yeah, split personality. Yeah, yeah. Or bipolar right? The, the church has a, in my opinion, has a combination of both those things because they really, really want to be Christian and they want to really be, you know, good Americans, but they also don't want to uh, throw everybody under the bus. They don't want to uh, uh, destroy the, the history of their early uh, leaders. So there's always a dichotomy between what they're doing. And sometimes it's in the very same manuals. I have a manual back there that talks about how wicked it was that uh, the Nauvoo Expositor printed, and this was printed by uh, William Law, uh, Joseph Smith's second counselor, uh, that, he, that he, the, the newspaper said that Joseph Smith, now this was, he said, the newspaper claimed as if it was a lie, that Joseph Smith was seeking political power and practicing spiritual wifery. And they have pictures of evil men in the newspaper printing this about Joseph Smith because it's a lie. Four pages in the same book, in the very same book. So if you can remember that and turn four pages, it says Joseph Smith did run for president of the United States and he did practice polygamy. So were there two, three, seven different authors of one manual? One says it was an accusation that wasn't true. Four pages down the road, we're proud of Joseph Smith because he ran for president of the United States and he began uh, polygamy. So, you know, which, which is it? This is a great example of this. Right here in the manual, it talks about the fact, and I'll, I'll read it to you, where uh, uh, Hiram Smith, Joseph's older brother, actually says, can you imagine this, in a student manual of the church, talking about the doctrine of polygamy. 
if you will write the revelation on celestial marriage, I will take it and read it to Emma. And I believe I can convince her of its truth and you will hereafter have peace. Why would he have to say that? Because there wasn't peace up until then. Because when she found out about it in her diary, she was very upset. She pitched that first copy into the fire. And then look what Hiram says also in the history of the church. Again, this is not printed by the Baptists. This is not printed by the Lutherans. This is not printed by the Church of Ephraim. This is printed by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Hiram comes back and says, Emma was very bitter and full of resentment and anger. I, and, and Joseph says, I told you, you did not know Emma as well as I did. I, to me, that blew me away as, as a Mormon because it started to gel after our first visit to Salt Lake down to Temple Square where they have that beautiful statue of Emma and Joseph holding arms and leaning back and looking into each other's eyes. And then I finally realized there's actually 33 more behind her, number one. And number two, as I'm asking the missionary that's standing there, you know, and I'm still a member of the church, and my wife thought I was possessed, I said, is it not true that Emma, this Emma, here in bronze in Salt Lake, left the church, taught against the church, and, and Brigham Young called her the damnedest liar on the earth. Oh, well, I had never heard that. Oh, okay, of course. But Emma Smith is, was no more different than Lee Baker. Left the church and taught against the church, Emma Smith. But they can't let her go because she's the elect lady of God. So they got to hold on to her in any way, shape, or form that they can. And I, I just thought that was, I thought that was amazing. And this is, this is the collection of, of things that really ate at me because uh, the integrity and honesty in the church. As several of you here in the room, you're either were bishops or in bishoprics, and you sat across from members of the church, and you asked them some pretty probing questions about their life about their marriage, about their honesty and integrity. And every year, uh, I would interview hundreds of people and ask them, are you a full tithe payer? Where did I have the right to ask somebody if they were a full tithe payer and whether or not they're gonna go into the temple and ask them personal questions? When, in comparison, I knew in the back of my mind, the integrity of the leadership of the church that started this church was much better than the man or woman sitting across from me at that desk. That is really hard to do, and that's the point of this subject, is that for some Mormons, the, the difference between who taught what and it doesn't agree with the Bible isn't such a big deal. But when you speak to the integrity of a human being, the person you're talking to, when they have to justify, lie about, or give excuses for men that they wouldn't have dinner with, that really hurts. Because after I came to know the personality, character, and integrity of Joseph Smith, I didn't want to be his neighbor. I didn't want to introduce him to my wife. We're not going on vacation. And I'm not going on a mission while he's in town with her. <laughs> Ain't going to happen. And it may, be a little, it may be a little humorous, but I'm telling you, it's absolutely true. I have had, with Kathy with me, conversations with active stake presidents. And when they realize that they are excusing the behavior of a man that is the leader of the church that they would today not associate with, it hurts on a different level. And it opens a door, it opens a possibility uh, to seek the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's the point of this lesson, is that within the manuals, within the lessons, within the actions and words of those men are the testimonies between you and that Mormon that they're not good people. And if they have, what was the quote? Kathy, I'm gonna have to stop for a minute. It's just absolutely amazing. When a, when a uh, honest man knows that he's been uh, misled, then he either ceases to be misled or he ceases to be honest. Mistaken. How true is that? So when you bring something to a good member of the church and you know them in your neighborhood and they really are good people, and they are, uh, it really hurts, uh, and I've described this in the book, the difference between the leadership 
today and they're still there and the average member of the church. That's why it's hard for a lot of you guys to, uh, to, to make the connection, the bridge between what a Mormon believes, what they, what they believe in their heart and how they act in your neighborhood, how they act on the PTA, how they act in the soccer field. Because they're, they're, they're really good people, but they don't know. Like the first chart, we really are teaching Mormonism to Mormons because they don't know what they don't know. 36 years I worked for the National Security Agency, it was all over the world, all kinds of really cool assignments and in charge of really cool programs and stuff like that. After I left the church, I had several coworkers and bosses uh, come up to me and they'd say, Lee, uh, now this probably wasn't true. You, you, we know you to be relatively intelligent and you were a member of the Mormon church? And, and they couldn't put that together. And that's because just as you sitting in this room, you now know more than 85% of the church. That's a true statement. And what you're doing is you're trying to lightly communicate that to them. And the best way I think to do it is through their own uh, scriptures and documents. Okay. This is the beginning of a very bizarre uh, story. So as I mentioned earlier, section 132, the beginning of that says that the, that the practice was known of as far as 18, 31. It wasn't recorded until 1843, but it wasn't printed until 1876. Those are not just dates and numbers. This isn't a boring high school history lesson, and we're talking about Napoleon and Waterloo and all that stuff. Think about what I just said. A doctrine of polygamy that was practiced in 1831, but not recorded until 1843, and not printed until 1876. What? You wouldn't let your high school principal do that. The integrity and moral standing of these men, again, is what spoke to me because I was on the front line explaining these differences to good Christians or exposing rules, regulations, and standards to people in my ward that I soon knew were better than the leaders I were, was following. So this is the statement that the church actually published. This statement says we don't practice polygamy. This is the statement that was valid from 1835 to 1876. That's the entire, that's the majority of the time when polygamy was at its height. Now, how can you find this? Where do you get it? You got three great choices. Right? Not only is it in the original copy of the Doctrine and Covenants, section 130, 101, verse 4, that's an 1835 version, and we have uh, several copies of that back there, but now it's online, and it's also in the history of the church. So we're going to give you three examples of where to find that statement. So the point is, is if you have time to have a conversation with a Mormon, and you ask them, why is it that during the height of polygamy, the church told its members and the United States and the public in general that they didn't practice that. Now, what word would we use to describe that if it was any other aspect of life other than religion? If you were, exactly, if you were marginally successful at the self-checkout at your grocery store, you would recognize this as a lie. But when we talk about religion, you can't use that word. So we won't use that word. We will just ask the Mormon, how is it that from 1835 to 1876, the church not only said, they also printed flyers to encourage converts in England to join the church. John Taylor, third uh, uh, prophet of the church, built flyers, even though he was a polygamist. Lee's gonna slow down again and repeat this. A polygamist member of the uh, Quorum of the Twelve goes on a mission in England prints a flyer that says we don't believe in polygamy to convert people to join the church. When those poor people in England go all the way from England and across the United States, get into Salt Lake, oh yeah, 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 we do, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Got any daughters? Got any daughters? <laughs> oh, oh, come on, that's, that's not me doing it, that's church history, that's fact. Teaching and practicing the fact that you don't practice polygamy when you really do, and then using that to combat rumors and bringing people into the church. How, how wicked is that? So where can that be found? This is volume two of the church history. I actually went and read this 
uh, in our ward in Colorado, and I came out of the room with a white, with a white face uh, because it was really a surreal but very uh, defining moment in my life. So I go into the ward library, you know, just an average member. Well, I was uh, elder, um, high priest group leader at the time, and I was exposed to the possibility that this might exist. I went into the library, and there's little kids running all around, and there's teachers and people are getting uh, chalk and erasers and, and, and books and just a really happy, polite scene, right? Good people in the library getting ready for their lessons. And I go past them and I reach up and I pull out this, uh, this volume and I flip it to the page and I read it and it was like the room went silent. The room just went silent. All the little kids were quiet in my mind because the impact of that statement hit me. And the impact is it was never true. Never in the church history was the statement that we don't practice polygamy valid. When they print it and say we do practice and we have these three rules, was that valid? So what I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, is within the documents you can hand to a Mormon, the practice of polygamy is much different than the management of polygamy. I never get into a debate about the evils of polygamy. I never get into a debate about whether it was right or wrong or whether it was in the Old Testament or whether God uh, supported it or not. I talk about the management, the evil management of that, where you say you don't do it and you do. And then you say you can do it and don't follow those instructions. And that doesn't take much to explain to a member of the church. It, it hits them on, on a core level because they've been told, like all of you have been told, that it was usually only crossing the plains. Indians come up and kill five or six men, and we got a bunch of women here without a husband. Well, somebody's going to have to take them up. I never found a single case of that. No, th this was done in a city. William Law's wife, there's hundreds of examples of this, but can you imagine, this is what split the church in the beginning. William Law is the second counselor of Joseph Smith. Joseph walks down two and a half blocks to the east, one block to the west, knocks on the door and says, the Lord told me you should be my wife. What? William's not here right now. You want to, what? <laughs> she says no. Two months later, he comes back again. Hey, this ain't my idea. This is God's idea. So this is why Lee does this. This is why Kathy does it. This is why we have that life verse that says, I will cut the ground from underneath those who want to compare with us. When people come or when our own children come and say, why don't you just leave us alone? Why don't you just let us believe what we believe and leave us alone? Because I believe in Christ and this is offensive to Christ. I believe in God. This is offensive to God. If my grandmother was being degraded somehow by someone in Chattanooga, I'd be there. I'd make sure that people understood that it was a lie. And I will certainly do that for Christ. For what he did for me, the least I could do is to stand up and, and defend his name. So truly what is happening in the church and what gives us the motivation to move forward is that these things cannot be done in the name of Christ and the men hide behind Christ and say, oh, it wasn't me. You're kind of cute, but it's not me. God told me I should come on down and, and, and knock this out. That's just not right. So it, it just, that's the basic and I better get going. Next slide. And I'm not going to cover the whole thing, so we'll go ahead and, and zip through it. And And those conclude my statements and we'll take any questions from slide 14 forward. Okay, does it, does it, does it matter? If I could go backwards, I'll go to a couple because you can read on your own, right? And, and, uh, okay, I'll leave it alone. I'll, I'll show you this. There's a slide in there that has a time frame on it. Uh, somewhere along the line. What's key about that time frame is what I just described to you is graphically represented because I'm a little slow and I like pictures. That's why I have charts and Kathy doesn't, is because they're, they're supposed to help me along. 
So that little chart in there shows you the years that, that polygamy was practiced, but the two different scriptures that validated whether or not we practice it or we don't. So that's, that's kind of key. And uh, there, there are several great uh, examples. Kathy tracked uh, within this document how to get to those documents online. So if you walk out, excuse me, if you walk out of here with nothing, you can still get to the internet. And I love the internet and the church is starting, uh, beginning to hate the church. So here's, here's the point. In there somewhere, there's a little page that shows you lds.org. All right, at lds.org, it goes to resources. You click on resources, you come down to resources, it'll say church history. You click on church history, it'll say Joseph Smith Papers. You click on Joseph Smith Papers, and it'll say search within Joseph Smith Papers. You type in there uh, crime of fornication, you click on that, it will bring up two documents. The second document is the statement I showed you. So if somebody says, I've never read that, I've never said that, and you're thinking, well, I can't walk into a, a LDS church library. We are giving you the skill to do this in front of them or alone at home. So on LDS.org, every single page that we've talked about thus far is available to you. That's the importance of those. And then at the very end of those slides, you'll see the link to the slides that you hold in front of you. So on Witnesses for Jesus, we have a little, and I don't know how to do these things, somebody else does not for them. We have a little blog page in a corner that has our testimonies and it has a link to our documents. One of those links is that entire set. So you now own an electronic copy of that and you can slowly go through it and it'll probably make more sense to you, uh, you know, without, without me uh, being there. I want to go to the, oh, I've got 10 minutes. Okay, then if I, oh, there we go. I, how about if I don't touch it at all? Would that be better? Okay. <laughs> Do we have, <laughs> I tell you what, you go forward and I'll stop on the one I want to talk, because I really want to talk about this one that we just added uh, uh, to, to the circumcision one, Kath. Uh, and uh, this we literally added uh, four days ago. Uh, and I don't know how I've missed this before. And this is what we, this is what we offer. Uh, we will come to your home, we will come to your church, we will come to your neighborhood, to a grocery store, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, we've retired. We believe that this is what the Lord has called us to for this reason. The first year that I came out of Mormonism and I so much respect all the different testimonies we've heard. Here's Lee Baker's testimony when I left the church after 32 years after, not that it makes any difference, after $375,000 in, in, in tithing. And literally, as those who have been members of the church, you know it is all consuming. You know it's every waking hour. And we had a good time. I'm not a mad Mormon. Uh, I, I was disgusted when I found out the history of the church. And then I was mad at God. I was mad at God for a while because I was wondering in, in all kinds of very graphic terms, why did I do this? What, what, what was the purpose of this? When I finally got on my knees, and here I'm talking slow because this is very important. When I finally got on my knees and said, why Lord did you do this to me? You know, it came to me, that was just training. Hello, 32 years of training. The only way he could use us to speak with Mormons clearly and concisely and have that communication among each other is to be one. So I was humbled for the grace of God to save me, to bring me out of Mormonism, rather than looking at it the wrong way and say, why was I ever in it? So I have tried to recreate all the feelings, all the memories, all the training, everything I've ever done as a bishop, high priest, group leader, elders, grown president, blah, blah, blah. And my children and friends and family have said, Lee, it wasn't all fake. No, it wasn't. So one of the hard questions they, they said before we get to this last slide is they said, are you telling me that when you were a bishop and you were given counseling to uh, people who had lost a child or who were considering divorce or a pregnant young teen that you did not feel the inspiration of the spirit? And I said, I absolutely did. And they absolutely did but that was not a confirmation that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was true. That was a confirmation that there was sitting the child of God 
and we had both gone to him in prayer. He doesn't turn away because you're a Lutheran, a Baptist, or a Presbyterian, or a young Mormon in trouble. It was not a confirmation that the church was wrong. It was a confirmation that we believed in Christ. He never left us. We never left him. But to learn these things was absolutely amazing. Absolutely, completely the edge of life. I wasn't sure that Kathy was going to follow me out of the church. In front of her, I had a stake president and the senior uh, uh, family counselor, I guess is what they called in Colorado, from church uh, LDS social services because it was kind of embarrassing to have a, a bishop come off the rails. Uh, so Kathy said, well, let's go to a counselor. Okay, let's go to a counselor, right? Well, the second meeting of the counselor, second meeting with the counselor, the counselor actually said, well, Lee, you gotta have the hope that you might not have to share Kathy in heaven. Ooh, exciting. Then everything's okay, I'm okay. And he added, and this is true, we can find another husband for Kathy. That's Christian. That's awesome. I stood up. He said, I feel threatened. I said, you should. He said, sit back down. <laughs> this here, you have a chart. I got to tell you this quick story. Uh, and, and we'll end on this because uh, uh, they get you in a great conference. And I don't want to drag this out. But after rereading the manuals that I grew up with, and this is sometimes the only way to find these little nuggets <clears throat> of pure 100% deceitfulness, is to really read the manuals. And man, you talk about uh, a hard thing to do and sometimes boring, but I learned a whole lot of different things about the book of Abraham, uh, about polygamy, about the oath and covenant of the priesthood, uh, about baptism for the dead, uh, about some of the teachings of the church by reading the manuals through and through. I started going through the Bible dictionary that Kathy talked to you about. And I encourage everyone, the next time this slide is printed, and we're going to put this online, there'll be something at the bottom that encourages every human being on the planet to go to lds.org and put in there the search free Bible. You don't have to do free Book of Mormon, free Bible. They will bring you a Bible. So if you don't have a Mormon copy of the Bible, I got several back there, take them and run. If you don't, have a chance to get that. This lesson comes from a Mormon version of the King James Bible. You go to lds.org, you have the little missionaries bring it over and you can ask them this question. You get a free Bible out of it. Now it's their version of the Bible, but you're gonna need that. I'm really serious about teaching from their own documents and they will love to come to your house. They don't come to my house anymore. <laughs> but we have done this four times before they finally put us on a list and then the missionaries will rotate and because I know how missionaries work and oh we know we can get that brother back and well come on over right so please lds.org you search and you say free bible they bring you a free bible and in the bible uh, uh, right after the bible dictionary is Joseph Smith's translations of the bible way slow way serious here you can ask a, 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 a Mormon much less a missionary what is the purpose of the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible? It is to correct the mistakes in the Bible. It is to bring back into God's order the things that were corrupted, the things that are missing, the things that are wrong. Awesome. I was literally reading each one of these corrections, and as several of you already know, there's awesome, goofy changes in the New Testament. But the fact that there are changes in the Old Testament was really intriguing to me. I stopped at Genesis chapter 17, imagine this. This is the short version. This chart shows it all, but here's the story. In Genesis chapter 17, Joseph Smith believed that there was a mistake on the covenant, on the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant of circumcision, okay? Kathy and I spent some time not only in Shechem, uh, but digging in Shechem, and that's the place where Abraham pitched his tent we were within 100 feet of wherever he pitched his tent, and God visited him and gave him the Abrahamic covenant. So this is the first time that God talks to Abraham, and he says, let's make a covenant between you and me, and the sign will be cutting the foreskin, circumcision. Okay, and he does that, and God says, do it when they're eight days old. Anybody in your household, if they're male, I don't, if you bought them, if they're, if they're slaves, it doesn't make any difference. So this is the very beginning of the covenant of circumcision with Abraham. That was changed by Joseph Smith. 
He changed it to eight years, not eight days. And on the surface, it doesn't sound like much of a deal. And it isn't about baptism. I have had six conversations with active Mormons, and they say, well, that's, that's because that's the age of accountability. I see the word, age of accountability for baptism. I don't see the word. Let's do that again. The age of accountability for baptism. Don't see the word. The age of accountability for circumcision. I do see the word, okay? So what did Joseph change? Joseph changed eight days to eight years. And in the book, because it blew my mind, I had to give an English lesson. A man who got nearly kicked out of high school uh, and, and could, uh, I wouldn't write letters now if it wasn't for spell check, can't do anything with the English language. I had to give a stake president a lesson on the function of a semicolon. Semicolon brings two independent clauses closer together, not further apart, closer together, right? And he said, well, that is a different statement. No president, it's not a different statement. The first statement and the second statement come closer together and it says circumcision, eight years. He goes, okay, well then that's it. Well, I didn't have the chart six years ago. It was just in my head and I can imagine. So I described to him, so you're telling me that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Malachi, Isaiah, all the prophets of the Old Testament to include Jesus Christ did it wrong. He goes, yeah. And God waited until 1830 for his best prophet, Joseph Smith, to fix something that had no impact on anybody? Well, no, I guess not. Exactly. So within the category of false prophecies, within the category that we all have learned about, where Joseph Smith has made a prophecy about the temple being built here or somebody going on a mission there, those are all valid. I think this is more powerful than all of that. This is Joseph Smith saying that Moses wrote it wrong and, and Abraham did it wrong and every Jew on the planet did it wrong. Eight days to eight years. And closing statement, on the south wall of the third floor of the Washington DC temple where Kathy and I were sealed for all time and eternity and where we spent most of our time when we were assigned to Washington, on the third floor of that beautiful temple, there's a painting that you might have seen of Jesus Christ with Mary and Joseph. They're going to the temple. They got two little doves. Two little doves are for the sacrifice. And they're bringing Christ as a baby, eight days old, to be circumcised. I'm in a Mormon temple. I point to the picture and I say, well, that's wrong. And people say, what do you mean that's wrong? Well, Joseph Smith said that didn't happen right. You're kidding me. Anyway, I want to in a Mormon way, but in a real way, bear you my testimony that I know the true gospel of Jesus Christ is true. And that what you are doing, what you have taken upon yourselves in whatever form or fashion the Lord has laid on your heart to reach out to the Mormons, that's awesome. You have no idea what that means and does for ex-Mormons. We look at each other and we share common bonds and we share common scars. And those scars are healed by your present. Those scars are lessened by your presence. Those scars mean less to us now, knowing that we don't have to go through what we did. Others, you are going to catch people that are going through the same thing we did. And it's a powerful, devastating yet awesome experience and we're just so grateful that you're part of the team it's just awesome and i just want to bear you that testimony in the name of jesus christ amen